we take this opportunity to welcome you all to this research day's activity. This is a activity put on by the School of Education, of course a part of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Let me take this opportunity to um, welcome a number of persons from first and foremost um, from the teachers colleges we have represented here um, persons from a number of teachers colleges um, Monique, um, Churches, um, Bethlehem, Shortwood uh, from the schools Herbert Marson who, okay. Great, great. Um, Edla Manley, um, and these persons will be uh, performing for us, persons from Edla Manley um, College. Also, let me welcome our colleagues from the School of Education. We have a number of the lecturers from the School of Education and a few students representative from the from the faculty uh, let me um, welcome you too we have um, Miss Hastings um, a close friend of the of the school a person who um, directed the education transformation activities in central ministry um, and uh, as far as I know, uh, she's doing a wonderful consultancy at this time and may still be connected to central ministry. No. Oh. <laughs> That's oh. Emphatic, no. Yeah. Also, um, let me welcome our guest speaker, who um, friend of the school, Dr. Maurice Smith. Sir, welcome. Yeah. The School of Education has, um, over the years, um, participated in many activities, uh, research days activities, and clearly this year is no different, no exception. We each time seek to, to um, come up with new ideas, new activities to apply a little more creativity in what we are doing. And this um, event, uh, we're going to demonstrate some of the creativity of the School of Education. This is a, I call it a two-pronged event, two-pronged event. And the first one um, will be the launch of the best practice magazine, as uh, Dr. Pauline Pereira um, um, named the the magazine, and um, it's the name of the magazine is Soul Trail, and Soul Trail is scholarship of excellence in teaching and learning, research, assessment, innovation, and leadership. And this is a quite a mouthful. Um, in terms of the title. It's a magazine for practitioners. So the School of Education, we have our, our journals, and that is fine. Our co colleague here is um, taking a little different approach, um, introducing a, a magazine which will serve persons in the classroom both at the college level, but also at the school level. And the first edition, uh, we have a copy. Um, you will see that. Right, first you will see that before we end the, the, the activity today. So, so persons will get a chance to share their experiences, insights, successes, challenges in the school. And, and I think we clearly need to do more of that. There's a tendency for, um, for, pers for schools, for lecturers, students themselves, 
you may have had successes in um, strategies you use in terms of teaching, but persons do not get a chance or do not take the opportunity to share these successes. So we hope the magazine will play such a role. So the first edition, uh, some of the um, contributors are here and they're from the um, different colleges. Yes. And if you look at the display here, these are some of the persons who have written. So this is paired review. So it's not just persons um, sending in something to be published. Whatever you submit um, would have gone through a thorough peer review process um, before included. So I'm asking you to look out for the magazine and um, when you get a chance you make your submission. We hope that this at least will be one of the tools to help um, us in the classroom at the level, at the tertiary level, but also in our schools to share information in terms of our successes and um, our experiences as we seek to improve the performance of education in our country. The second activity, and my colleague will expand on this, um, called the the Scholarship of English Language Teaching and Learning, Caribbean Commons, and it's a professional learning community. So um, the colleague will um, take some time to elaborate um, further on that. But just to say, as a part of the introduction, that the approach taken here was that we, we identify colleges, schools, of course, the School of Education, and we are taking a, a collaborative approach in the two events, of course, led by um, Paulette um, Ferreira. So let me thank you for coming out and sharing with us today as a part of our research days activity of the University of the West Indies. I now move to Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot. Dr. Wilmot, <laughs> to say a few words. Professor Disraeli Hutton, Dr. Murray Smith, um, members of the Faculty of Humanities, colleagues from the colleges, colleagues from the school, relatives, friends, well-wishers, good afternoon. It's a bit hot, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever wondered, have you ever reflected on how some people can get things done uh, while others who have equally brilliant ideas remain in a position of inactivity? Have you ever thought of that? They remain in what I would want to call this afternoon a state of not getting it done-ness. Only for today. I want to suggest to you that one of the qualities, that impetus, that propels people to accomplish task is courage. But you do not have to take my word for it. Stephen Covey, who is a renowned educator and businessman, articulates it this way. To set and work toward any goal is an act of courage. I do not know about you, but I do believe that the two initiatives that have brought us here this afternoon, 
the Scholarship of English Language Teaching and Learning, which is the professional community, and the Scholarship of Excellence in Teaching, Learning, Research, Assessment, Innovation, and Leadership, SOTRAIL, is these two initiatives were born of courage. It takes courage to initiate, to pioneer, to forge through layers of obstacles and disappointments to attain a goal. It took an act of courage to win the contributors buying for this learning community. Also think that it took yet another rung of courage to trust that these contributors would not disappoint. And I could go on and on and on. But I believe that it will take even higher levels of courage to keep soul, soul trail blazing. Nonetheless, I am confident that those of you in this partnership who are blessed with what Aristotle called the first virtue, which is courage, will implant in those who are most in need of it and nurture it so that we can build this legacy of research and elevate teaching of and learning of English language in the Caribbean and Jamaica in particular. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it is with a very strong sense of mission and accomplishment, of optimism and pride, of openness and expectancy, that I bring greetings to this very important gathering of educational partners on this significant occasion on behalf of the departments of English within Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. We view, this, we view this move as an opportunity for the departments of English within the colleges to have greater educational impact. We see this as a way to move from being predominantly consumers of the proceeds of research to being generators and co-producers of research knowledge and creation. And believe me, this excites us, right colleagues? Yes, it does. So we anticipate an atmosphere of nurture, one of mutual gratification, an atmosphere of reciprocal influence, symbiotic benefits, trust, and respect as we work together to advance scholarship. Finally, I extend thanks and congratulations on their behalf to the School of Education for partnering with us and we laud its efforts to improve teaching and learning and for positioning research as the conduit for achieving this. I assure you, we are ready. Thank you. And now we're going to ask the architect of all of this to come forward and um, explain and um, inform about these activities. Dr. Paulette Freira. Thank you, Professor Houghton. Oh, Lord. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say all protocols observed, please. Uh, we are off to such a late start, but I must single out, like our guest speaker, Dr. Marie Smith, and all my colleagues from the faculties across the colleges. I say colleagues, I think I perhaps should say partners, because we have moved to another level of understanding. And a special recognition to all the, the students from the teachers' colleges. I think it is good that you are here with the hope of catching this vision. To share the vision that led to these two developments would be to speak from my heart. I tried to write it down, but the pages couldn't contain it. I tried every other version, and I just said, let me just speak it as it was. How it all started. And interestingly, it started right in a teacher's college. 
I remember asking my language methods instructor one afternoon. It was a Thursday. I remember everything about the afternoon. I really wanted to be on the play field doing netball or something. But she was going through a long trustee of language teaching methods in her language methods class. And I made one mistake to ask a question. Then it was a mistake. I asked her this question. So miss, what methods do you have to teach English to children who don't speak English? I was 19 years old. Innocent question, but I needed an answer. I didn't get an answer. I got a proper lashing of the tongue. What other language could they be speaking? English is the only language. What are they speaking? Why would we need to be looking for methods for these things? Creole is not a language. Is it the patois you're referring to? And it was so scornful, condescending, everything that was wrong about the language that I spoke so naturally. And I decided that I was going to find a way to do this since I couldn't get it from my instructor. I want one daring task. I decided for my internship, when my supervisors were coming to see me, I was going to do a lesson with a method that I developed to do that. Everyone said, Paulette, don't do that. They're going to fail you. And I said, fail they must. Because I'm going to find out if nobody can tell me. I guess, Anne-Marie, that's the courage that you're talking about. Because, I mean, who wants to sacrifice an A to do something that you know is not going to be accepted? Isn't that how it goes, ladies? Or those days have gone. And so I did that. But then, throughout my professional career, the question flipped. Instead of now asking, what methods do you have to teach English to children or speakers who don't speak English? I now ask, what is the alternative to method? That's the question I now ask. I don't want to hear about the methods anymore. I want to hear about an alternative to method. Because that is what has happened to our entire English language teaching fraternity. We have got caught up with methodologies. What method should I use? And I see the esteemed linguist, Creole linguist, sitting in the room. So I have to be very careful. But we already know that none of the methods that they have in all the books that we have researched have ever satisfied the method that we need. English as a second language, that has become a cliche, doesn't do it. English as a foreign language doesn't answer the question. English as a second dialect doesn't answer the question either. So who does that question rest with to sustain? And who provides the answer? Ladies and gentlemen, it's you and I, all of us. Because what we are now operating in is a post-method paradigm. A time in our education system where we have to decide that we have to grow a local and indigenous approach to deal with the problems that we have. And the day we begin to do that, we will stop focusing on the problems and look towards the possibilities. So this is what we call charting new terrain. And can I tell you, I'm not I might be blazing the trail here. But a trail, someone tried to light it, but you know, everybody still, so what method? Method has become now a bad word in English language teaching for Creole speakers because the answer, the solution rests with us. And so throughout my sojourn here, I've always tried to do something that was outside of the box. Thinking outside the box is not enough actually doing something outside of the box is the best thing because thinking outside the box is a cliche it's not supported with any kind of action and so that's where we went a step further and so my entire charting of a television learning studio where we could ask teachers in training here to 
stage the literature texts that they were doing just to find a method of how to build a print-rich environment that was different. To read the script, you're not reading paper anymore. So it was a performance-rich environment that created this idea that we could stage literature texts and then interpret them better. And then it grew into incorporating radio as a means of engaging teachers and other professionals in discussing, trying to find a way out and solutions. And that gave birth to the Media in Education Center for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And in that particular center, we house the professional learning community, the Scholarship of English Language, Teaching and Learning, Caribbean Commons. Now in Jamaican context, when we use the word commons, it's holy pop it near run up and down, you know, don't. You know, commons, country, commons running up and down outside. But that's not quite it. I thought I would appropriate that to mean that we are doing something that's indigenous, local, and with it for us, coming from us as practitioners. And, and so, with the idea now that this is a media-driven intervention, then we had to find the print mode to support all of that. And that led to the birth of So Trail, the magazine. And my colleagues have asked, why a magazine? We put scholarship or scholarly work in journals. And that's the problem with labeling. That's the problem with boxing ourselves in the conventions that are turned by others. Because the word magazine is associated with gardening, sports, and playboy. Is that, am I right? So it's a magazine that is frivolous and just for social, you know, and leisure. That's not it at all. What we have here is a best practice magazine because we want to own this space. We want to carve out this space to say that it is distinctly Jamaican. That you can do peer-reviewed research and put it on a CD for all I care. Whoever said it has to be just in something that's called a journal. And so this kind of innovation was intended to do something that we could own for ourselves, something that we could showcase the, 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 this, the single classroom teacher's research. Because everyone thinks that the only persons who are supposed to be engaged in research are those in academia like universities. Every single teacher ought to be a researcher. Because if you don't research your classroom, how can you inform your practice? So the magazine is intended to close all of those gaps, to carve out a new comfortable space where all of us, a lecturer at the University of the West Indies, a lecturer at the Teachers College, a lecturer in any private sector, anybody who has an interest in education, and above all, students, even students engage in in their um, school-based ass assessment where they do research. That's the space for you to publish whatever you can do for an input. And so this afternoon, yes, it is courage that brings me here. And what Dr. Wilmot perhaps didn't say, that when something is fueled by courage to sustain it, hmm, to sustain the courage, because you can be brave today and be very scared tomorrow. So what it calls for is a level of commitment and accountability. Hence, the need to put it in a public space. Because once we launch this venture, then we need to sustain this. And it is at this point that I want to thank the colleges for, and in particular, the language teaching faculties of the colleges for inviting me into their space when they had their professional conference so I could share the idea. And uh, as you can see, some of them have published in the, in the magazine today. And we also have a student from Meadowbrook High School who has published in the magazine as well. And so this is what it's all about. 
So it's powerful, it's courageous, it's different, it's unique, but it's research. Never forget that. And it's in a magazine and it's our space that we are going to appropriate to make it more accessible to us. So as soon as they get here, you will see. Thank you so much for offering me this opportunity just to share what is an idea that has been with me from the day I stepped into a teacher's college and that has sustained until today. The search has not stopped. And the last thing that I'll say, it was supported by a Mona Fellowship Award that I got to look for the innovative teacher of CXC English. And it has mushroomed into a center that has a best practice magazine. Thank you so much. Thanks very much to Dr. Ferreira for giving us a very broad and deep overview of the energy, the courage, the commitment, and the enthusiasm that have together propelled us to this day. Doc, Prof. Hutton has had to leave, and since it's nice to talk about West Indies cricket now, we can <laughs> use some cricket metaphor. He, so he, he didn't retire hurt. Um, he simply made a quick couple fours at the, at the wicket and decided that since the, the bowling is so, is so manageable, he would have someone else... Um, participate at the wicket. So uh, here am I um, standing in his stead. Thanks again to Dr. Paulette and her colleagues. We now invite uh, Mr. Eugene Williams from the Edna Manley College for the Visual and Performing Arts to come and do their, his piece. I think he's accompanied by a colleague so they'll occupy the space for the next few minutes, and then we will speak again on the other side. Mr. Williams, your time. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether I should say MC or cricketing umpire, deputizing cricketing umpire. Um, the program says, my little, oh, there's some people that can't see me. Yeah, the program says that what you're about to see is a cultural item. And that expression often doesn't tell the tale or tell the story of what you're about to see. So I just want to say what you're about to see is not just a performance, not just a show. It's a performance research project that is currently being conducted by a student at the School of Drama at, at the Edna Manley College. Uh, it's, and in this project, she is devising a performance, a one woman, one person performance that is coming out of her research. She's final year and she's in the BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, and they are required to do a course called Independent Study. And this course uh, is followed, or rather fo follows, a, a course called Research Methods. That Research Methods culminates with a, a project proposal, which has a research question, they are supposed to, the students are required then to go on to do research on that particular question, out of which they devise a performance. Uh, so in this case today, student J.C. Lewis has a re research question which, which says, how does colorism as a social construct affect the darker skinned individual in the Caribbean. Uh, she, as, as I said, it's, it's, it's a performance in progress so that 
this event for her today is part of that research. It will perhaps help to refine and develop the performance as perhaps her research questions as well. Thank you for listening to me in that introduction. And now student J.C. Lewis will present. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I don't want to speak very long. Um, I would like to say, however, that it is probably going to be best if you can find a seat a little further forward. If you can come a little further forward, it's also actually a lot cooler in the front. There's some natural AC blowing through this little space here. So if you can find a space that's a little further forward, it will probably be a better experience. Um, I'd also like to say that there are some limitations that the space creates. I am in the process of building this work, and the space that I'm currently building the work in, thank you very much, the space that I'm currently building the work in is very different to this particular space. So I ask you to bear with me, there are some things that probably um, won't be done as um, built. Again, it is a work in process. I do hope you enjoy. Uh, yeah, it's an extract actually of the working process, so it's still not even fully what's been worked out, but I really hope that I can get some feedback and we can have a little chat afterwards, yeah? Yeah? yeah. This is a very interactive show, yes? Yeah? So um, I'm gonna need to, I'm gonna need to hear you. So we're gonna do a little warm up, we're gonna do a little warm up, right? Hi everybody. Hi. How are you? Everybody's doing well? Yes. Great, fantastic. I hope that we get more interactive as we go along. There's a tar baby in the ring. 
Her hand again. That's a powerful work of art. Yes. Dr. Morris Smith, international educational consultant, is our guest speaker for this evening. I don't think he needs an introduction, but I'll tell you. Just two things about him. Apart from the fact that he's hard working and well read, which I suppose go together normally for a scholar, he says that once a teacher, always a teacher. And his mission is to do even better. Let's welcome Dr. Smith. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Ferreira, distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the faculty here at the university and certainly our colleges across the length and breadth of this country. Permit me, or forgive me if you will, but I do need to acknowledge Miss Jean Hastings with whom I have a special relationship. She was once my boss and I was once her boss. <laughs> and now we're friends. <laughs> And let me also introduce Ambassador Wilma McNeish, who is the retired ambassador to the Kingdom of Belgium. Ladies and gentlemen, all good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Thank you so very much for the opportunity to share with you today. I, I deem it a pleasure and I feel very much at home. Were it ever to be said that I have a mastery of the language, then I would certainly have to attribute that to the prowess of my teachers, none of whom at the time when they taught me had a university degree. I didn't know my teachers were human. I didn't even know my teachers had sex. I thought my teachers were gods. School would start at 8.30 and we were required to arrive at, on campus by 7.30 and when we got to our classrooms there was work on the board. I don't know if that's your experience but to add insult to injury having gone home with homework and having come back the next day with 300 items on the board to add insult to injury we were then told to exchange the books. I didn't know these people lived anywhere. I didn't know they had a life outside of school. I, I really thought that they were gods. In developing my competence in the language, I taught several things. Basically, there are four components. We were taught that we had to listen. Oh, how I wish some of our people would learn how to do that. We were taught how to speak. We were taught how to read. And we were taught how to write. Those four functions are critical to the development of, of la one's language abilities. Those were basic fundamental skills. And beyond that, we were introduced to higher order thinking skills. So, the discussion about critical thinking is, is, is nothing new. It, is, it has been around from the day man was created. I could do a quick class on theology, but I won't do that. So critical thinking has been around for centuries. We were taught how to infer, how to draw conclusions, how to evaluate, how to analyze, how to uh, form judgments. These were things that were literally and actually taught in our classrooms. My own experience as a student is such that I've seen many teachers, what they do, they teach the form. So they teach composition. They give the student a passage and say, read the passage two or three times and answer the questions without having first taught that there are literal level questions and there are inferential and there are critical. So there are particular skills and competences which one must develop, which one must nurture and incubate if one is to uh, develop his prose as it concerns the language. So what very many of our teachers do is that they say, write an essay, write a, 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 a passage, and you're taught the form. What we perhaps are not taught as well as we ought to be taught are the skills which are transferable from subject to subject, from discipline to discipline. So the syntax and the grammar and the composition and the vocabulary development and the punctuation, all those are particular skills, all strands of the language which we must develop if it is we're going to excel as it concerns the language. What makes a descriptive piece different from an essay? What makes one, what are the nuances that determine when one should say please versus kindly? How do you determine, how do you know when to use short sentences vis-a-vis -vis continuous prose? How do you build vocabulary? How do you know when to use literary devices, not necessarily be taught, not only be taught what they are, but how to use them to engage the reader, to engage the listener? These are skills that must be explicitly and purposefully and intentionally and deliberately taught if it is that we are going to develop our abilities concerning the language. So here we are today, so gathered here present on campus. 
a launching, introducing a professional learning community. And it's of paramount importance because the lecturers who sit here complain that our students, though coming to us with, with, with grade, grades one and two, struggle with the language. And when you meet our colleagues who, who work in our teachers' colleges, they say, oh, no, it's not them. They work very hard. That the secondary school system is broken because these are individuals who, have, who would have gone through five years of English language and perhaps would have earned a one with straight A profile, and yet they don't have the requisite skills. So it's not them. They work hard. And when you move across to the primary school teachers, they say, oh, no, they, they are not at fault that the GSAT is broken and here we are on the verge of introducing PEP and the critical thinking skills are to be taught. And when you, it's not them because they're working hard. And when you move across to the early child level, the teachers there say, no, it's not their fault. Government needs to regulate and they give you a litany of reasons and good reasons too, but that's not the issue. They say, no, the challenge is not theirs. It's because the parents come from homes, the kids come from homes which are broken. And when you move into their homes, having left university and having left high school and having left primary school and having left early childhood institutions, when you move into their homes, the women say it's not them, that the men's genes are bad. <laughs> And we simply can't find the men to get an account as to why is it that the language ability is not what it ought to be. So this professional learning community is of paramount importance because it brings everyone to the table. Because if truth be told, we are all experiencing the same challenge, perhaps to a different degree, but the same challenge nonetheless. I'd like to suggest three things for your consideration today. Number one, I, I, and before I do that, I, 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 I'm just recalling, you know, I had had two fourth formers who were taught, who were scolded by their teachers, actually, and I tutored them and they got a distinction with straight A profile. And then I was introduced to a grade six student who had moved across to grade seven and tutored him English as well. And he got a grade three and it was a big thing. And I'm saying, no, it's not a big thing because again, this is how I was taught by my teachers who did not have a university degree. If truth be told, when we went into class, we couldn't just give an answer. We had to conjugate words every single day. And whether or not, when we gave the answer, if we were unable to give the convention, the rule, the explanation, with good reason, if the answer were correct, but the rationale were incorrect, we couldn't get credit. So we had to know, and, and, and that thing has been riveted in our system so much so, that now when I read often in the dailies, and there are several errors there, and when I listen on television and I listen to the, the broadcasters speak, and there are several errors there, something goes off in my head because I was taught the rules of the language. I would have developed an appreciation of what makes English, the English language, what it is. I would like to suggest three things to you today. Number one, this PLC, this magazine, the, the, the research that we're embarking on, and we are writing and documenting for future generations. It's going to be important that we understand that the language allows for the embrace of self. It defines who we are as a people. That we are, we are black people. And when you go to the, Uni to, 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 to the United States and elsewhere, there are no brown people, you're either black or why? And here, and it's a beautiful demonstration that we would have seen on stage today on the podium as opposed to the lecture. That we have to use the language to recount our stories. We must teach our teachers and teach our students how to accept who they are. And unfortunately, the reality of the capitalistic society in which we live today is such that people feel that if you speak well, you must be rich. You must come from a particular class. There must be something wrong with your sexuality. It is unfortunate, and these are some social constructs with which we must contend. But the English language is such that it allows us to embrace who we are. We must teach our people to talk and write about themselves and to accept the fact that they are Jamaicans, they are poor and there's nothing wrong with the circumstances from which you have come. It's not your circumstances that define who you are and certainly it's not your circumstances that define your future. 
The language is only a vehicle. It's only a medium to get you from point A to point B. We must teach our people how to accept themselves and how to embrace who they are. And you know at my, my age and stage, and I get a kick about, out of saying that every time I say it, at my age and stage in life, because to live to be my age these days is a blessing. Yes? All you young people, you're getting there. <laughs> I get a kick out of saying that because these days when you are allowed to die naturally that's a gift that's a gift we must teach our people to accept who they are and we have too many people walking around this place perhaps they have money in their pockets perhaps they have a house and a car but those things do not define who you are at the very core and soul of humanity we must teach our people to accept themselves and to embrace who they are let me let me a, a quick example as to how this thing plays out Someone comes from another country and they speak with a certain rhythm and a certain intonation. The Matuang. And somehow we feel that their, their use of the language is correct even when there are glaring breaches to the language. Because we have been taught and schooled to believe that how we speak. I was elsewhere and said to someone, I was in Washington and said to someone a few years ago, you know, you people who speak the American language, that's a deviation from the Queen's language. And I nearly got thrown out of the room. We must, we, we must teach our people to embrace who they are. We are who we are. And there is no shame in who we are. If it is that we were not born, that for which we were created to do will never get done. There is a particular purpose for which you have come. And the language gives you portability to so in, enact your mission. So the language helps us to embrace self. Secondly, the language ex helps us to express our sentiments. Hmm. I've sat at the feet of teachers and heard them use some expressions that made me think, hmm. I was in a meeting once, I actually I was in a board meeting once, and I don't know where my mind went, and I was breaking a cookie. But it was one of those moments, you know, you have your senile moments and there was a gap in my consciousness and I don't know what I was thinking about, but what brought me back to, to reality was that half of the cookie ended up in my jacket here and the other half ended up in the chairman's face. I, I, I don't know what happened, I, I couldn't explain it. I don't know what happened, I perhaps was bored to death. I don't know what happened, I don't know how it happened. But I simply said, sir... I, 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 I apologize, I'm sorry. And you know, the next meeting, at the start of the meeting, somebody said, okay, Maurice, hold your cookie. And, and I said, you know, and I said, and, and I said to her, and you have the unmitigated gall to say that here and now, because you know, those who were not there at the last meeting now know that something had happened to my cookie. And she said to me, unmitigated girl and I said yeah yeah I talked about that another time because you, I had had good teachers we must teach our people to use the language to express their emotions we were not built to keep our emotions in, in, in our bodies when people do us good we must say good job I'm proud of you I'm happy and equally when they get us mad we should say I'm not happy with your having done so or having said so and so and so I tell you it's not worth it going to bed at night and keeping people up in your heart you will die it's not worth it speak express yourself say what it is that you have to say express your emotions the language gives us the portability to express our sentiments so when somebody bad drives you on the road, you know, people cause, well, people, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, people use some colorful language, words, primarily because they don't know how else to express themselves. We cannot be lecturers and students and, and benefactors of a tertiary education, and yet we have an inability to express ourselves appropriately. What then is the difference between them and us? The language gives us the, the, the portability, the vehicle that we need, the modality that we need to help us to better express our sentiments. So the language helps us to embrace ourselves. The language helps us to express our sentiments. And the language helps us to explore our solutions. Hmm. I don't know if you listened. I don't know if you tuned in last night to the... State of the Nation address. Did you? Boy, oh, it was colorful. I, 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 I chuckled and I went to bed. 
I don't know if you're following what's happening with uh, our Venezuelan colleagues vis-a-vis -vis Brexit, the, the, the Chinese Silk Road, and I could go on and on and on. It is interesting, it is remarkably, if not ironic to my limited mind, that people who make decisions across the world which have generational impacts are often graduates of university education. And yet it seems to me that we are schooled well, particularly well, in the art of identifying problems as opposed to the science of finding appropriate solutions. And you know, you have your, 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 your colleagues on campus in your meetings at every time, and every time you raise an issue, they say it can't be done because they lack the courage. Okay, so every time you raise an issue, someone finds a problem instead of finding the solution because we have been schooled to have this dependency syndrome and others. And the answers that we need lie within us. The language helps us. The research helps us. And there, it's, it's Black History Month. We could talk about Garveyism. We could talk about the, the, the religiosity of Bob Marley. We would go on and on and on. But they give us a philosophy that, that says that the answers that we need are within. And everything that we need exists inside the house. We must find, explore solutions to our problems. And the language helps us to do that. The more we talk, the more we dialogue, the more we realize that we may be different. We may have come from different circumstances, but I'm no different from you. You are no different than me. We are all human beings on the sojourn of life. And the pathways are different, but the destination is certainly the same. So can I congratulate you? on these courageous initiatives, but can I implore you, can I beseech you, can I ask you that when you're meeting your groups to talk about English language, to help our teachers to not just teach the form, but to teach the skills, to help them to understand that the skills of the English language are such that we can embrace ourselves, we can appreciate who we are, we can express our sentiments and articulate our emotions, and certainly we can identify and explore our solutions. Thank you. Here's to the language. It's clear that Dr. Smith was an excellent language student. Your teachers would have been proud of you. I hope that um, you'll have the opportunity if, uh, sometime in the future, if you haven't had it as yet, to have them hear you speak <laughs> and to see the product that they have created. So language as a, as a tool for nurturing self-acceptance, language is a tool of self-expression, and language is a tool for exploration and for finding solutions to our problems. I've been saying, Dr. Smith, colleagues, that one of the underlying challenges which face our education um, system, which faces our system, is the problem of the very thing you raised, lack of critical thinking, the inability to use language. And it is at the heart of much of the violence we see because people resort to expressing themselves physically rather than verbally to move, to talk about the solutions to the issues between them. So we thank you for engaging this um, issue in the way you have. This magazine, in many ways, represents an opportunity for persons from diverse backgrounds to share their experiences and to demonstrate their competences in the use of language to articulate new directions and new possibilities for the challenges which face our society. I'm going to open the floor for a couple of us who wish to do some reflection. Your part of your journey to this place where you are a contributor to this magazine, your own struggles with the language in terms of your, the things you observe that people do and how deficits in the language may account for that and the kind of solutions that you, you, you want to share that we should explore. 
So we're having an open mic session for the next seven minutes. My clock is saying um, eight minutes to three. Is that what your clock is saying? Yes. Ten minutes? Okay, my, I, I, I'm a little fast. Yeah, right. So we open the mic, we open the floor for a couple have, minutes. Uh, oh, thank you, Dr. Kano. I think just on the eve of actually launching the magazine, I would really, could you do something for me, please, Doc? Just put that right there, because this is a part now that I need to actually acknowledge the brave ones among us. Just put it where they can actually see the images. Everybody can see that? Or we might put it on the stage. Put it on the stage. And uh, by virtue of the fact that some persons have formed that circle, then they have to speak their seven, in the, within the seven minutes. And... Uh, I could not have done this alone. And the seeds for this were sown in my mind, but I had to share it with others. And almost everyone who is sitting in this room, coming from a teacher's college or wherever the institution, contributed something to this, this magazine in a special way. And this is the forum. They might never come out to say it, but I'm going to pull them out. What do we say in Jamaica? We're going to draw them out? <laughs> yes. We're going to pull them out. I have to express myself with the language. Come on. I have two languages, right? So I'm going to draw them out. <laughs> okay. And look at the circle, please. You will notice that those are the contributors, the, the first contributors for this. And I want to just laud my colleagues in a way. I, I know they don't want me to do it, but every single one contributed something. I grew in the process of me doing this magazine. Can you imagine? I grew. Because I did this so that I, I could grow as well and to allow others to grow in the process. And as I single you out and call your names, forgive me, but I have to do it. Because in your own way, you contributed to the writing process. It was double blind peer reviewed, you know, because I make sure I double it. Not even just blind, just blind review, double. Because the bottom line is that we are not going to take any challenges to the fact that all of this richness is in a magazine. Because you know some persons will say, oh, but it's a magazine. And so I want to acknowledge someone like Diane McCallum. She's standing right out there and she don't want me to call her name. But she's a historian, not a language person. Dan, Dr. Dan McCallum, let them see who you are. <laughs> I know and she was trying to hide and I called her first because she's on the verge of doing down, going down the steps. Dan has an, an, an article in there because Dan is all about teacher education and development and reflective practice. So she has an article and was part of the writing process. So I called you first, Dan. Because you had to step down. But the two persons I want to start with first and foremost before I come to the lecturers are my two year one postgraduate students. You notice I said year one? They just put their feet into the master's program. And I pressured them. I cajoled. I celebrated with them. They edit with for me. They do all kinds of things encourage whatever I'm talking about. Yone Donald, please stand. And I'm talking about Navita Roberts. Year one, just in their first, just in, into their second semester. These are regular classroom teachers. And there are others who have contributed to the volume, but they are not here at this point. And now I come to my colleagues in the colleges. And what would I have been able to do without Anne-Marie and, and Cherie? Because if, if they didn't write, then it would have defeated the whole purpose because this is supposed to be a collaborative effort and we needed to even have at least one person from any of the entities to help us to show that this is possible. So Dr. Anne-Marie Wilmot, I want you to stand and take your bow. And Mrs. Shalee Kerr, I want you to stand and take your bow. Dr. Janet Williams, I want you to stand and take your bow. You don't see her picture up here, but let me tell you, enough prayer. <laughs> a lot of, because it took courage. And I also see other members from the Shortwood community. Please stand, because I came to your staff room, and everybody said it's a nice idea. You see, what I'm trying to say to you, that anything that you put your heart together, 
You don't have to wait for validation from the whole world. Once you believe in yourself, part of what Dr. Smith was saying, once you know it can be done, you're going to just do it. And if one person who I know has invested a lot in me, it's Anthony Perry. I don't know if he has left the room here. He was sitting right over there. Every Sunday, I drag out this man as if he doesn't have a life and carry him on new stock, 93FM, for the UWI English Olympiad. I mean, can you imagine somebody does that for you for as part of your dream? I want you to put your hands together for him as well. And my members of my colleagues from the School of Education, I don't know how they put up with me because I, I just don't only think outside the box, you know. I act outside the box. Not a normal person standing here. They say you're right. All of them say that. And yes, you, you say you're right just to remind me of Herbert Morrison Technical High School who were in the English Olympiad. Ladies, stand with your principal. Take your bow. <laughs> they were the ones who were on the UWI English Olympia that, you know, that the, the whole magazine. It's a whole, for me to be able to say to somebody, I have this dream, or I'm going to do this thing, and they invest so much in me. Am I not special? You don't think so? Clap me. Me more special. Siobhan, my students over there. I mean, to know that you do. I mean, it's such a pleasure. What I'm trying to say to you, there are people around you who you can tap into in order to achieve what you want. You don't have to do it alone. I'm saying it to you young ladies there from Shorto. There are persons around. Just find somebody who believes in what you're doing. Look at Dr. Smith. I mean, I get the best of the best. Look at the girl at Edna. Come here, sweetheart. Come give me your black sister a kiss. <laughs> I mean, good. Excellent. And she wants to get some feedback. So while we're snacking, you make sure you tell her. Because remember, it's research. She's doing her research. I mean, this is the spirit I want to sustain. Edna Manley is part of us. Edna Manley School for the Performing Arts. Monique, church, all of the colleges, school of education. We are all one because we are trying to research and understand the same language environment. We don't have research that's on, you know, like you have level one research and level two research and level three research. Like doctors who do research and classroom teachers who do research and students who do. No, no. Research is research. And it goes through the same rigor. It goes through the same process. Thank you, my black sister. Yeah, yeah. Yes, my darling. Excellent research. And look at how she's doing it. Look at what Edna Manley's doing. Who writes that down? That's what concerns me. We have spent generations trying to read all of the books from abroad. And never our own. And we don't write any for ourselves. Because we are so afraid. Because every time we speak or we write, people censor our language and we get afraid. We are timid because we don't want even to get your work peer reviewed. People just don't want to see anybody else. When did it become something that our language is something that's going to prevent us from becoming who we are? When it is supposed to shape who we are. Isn't that so? And so we want to mash down those lies. What, what Bar Muta Baruka would say, abrogate it abrogate it, mash it down. It can be done. And what we want to see as of now, I want to see other lecturers coming out to do, a, you know, like one of the issues. Because right now, what happened with this, I ended up with two issues. Still waiting for them to surface from the printer. Don't worry, these are just behind there. You see here? Oh, there you go. Boy, what would I do without oh, my sidekick? Dr. Canute, we are the creators of centers on the campus. He's gone on to his second one now, you know, Miss Hastings. Mm -hmm. And he don't get no funding for the first one, but it doesn't stop him. You understand? He's the, he's the center man, you know? And, and this is what we mean. We need a space where, as colleagues, we can celebrate our ideas and have people buy into it. Right? And look at it. This is what it looks like. And we want it to be commonplace, not meaning common. You know the difference. Commonplace, 
You know, when you go on Caribbean Airlines, they have their in-flight magazine. And when you go in British Airways, they have theirs. Accessible, you go to the dentist or somewhere, you take up a health magazine and you browse through it. So why we can't have teaching accessible, what we do, anywhere. You see, that's why I package it this way. So it can be almost anywhere. A teacher, staff room, everybody must be dying to see the next issue that's coming up in there. And of course, the fact that it's magazine, you know, it comes with what we love. Picture. You remember you used to play picture or no picture? Yes, picture. You know, and the, it's celebratory. It's different. But can I tell you something? What's in here is scholarly, rigorous, peer-reviewed, blind peer-reviewed, I mean, proof edited. That's it. It went through all the rigors of what a, a, a journal or any other Thing that would have packaged this kind of research. And so, I want you to put your hands together for the writers who are there celebrated, because without their contribution. And my sweetheart, before the call for papers come, you try to write up that piece of research, because it has to go in here. Who, who can do performance research? You know, it, that's research. The research questions were there. I hope, you know, at short, when you're taking a little, you, you know, the little A, if the A is the excellence we're talking about, you know, everything on this program has been excellent this evening. Excellent speaker, excellent performer, excellent me. <laughs> Understand? The bottom line is that we have it all inside of us, just waiting for, you know, for it to come out. And the only, the only challenge the teachers' colleges have, and I know they have it, because I've been there, they teach so many courses, that when you get home, the creativity gone. No part of your body can take a creative thing. You fall asleep with the TV watching you. I mean, everybody does. Why don't we write a research paper about that? You see what I'm getting? And to see if we can come up with solutions as to what, you know, how we can overcome that. The bottom line is that this afternoon marks a professional learning community. And can I tell you, the School of Education is positioned to take this to the Caribbean because we pride ourselves with the fact that we have our online platform where we teach all across the world. So we're taking the conference to the world and we're right in our bedroom. Just make sure you don't put on the camera. You understand? You can always not show yourself, we hear your voice. So all of these fantastic ideas, all of that, that's what I call scholarship as well, because we are searching, we're searching for solutions and answers. This is not about problems. This is not about problems. This is about what I have tried, what I have done, what is exciting and what I'm celebrating. Even if it's to write a lesson plan for Dr. Williams a different way. And if Dr. Wilmot tell you that this is how it is done, Try to take a little out of me as well. I was daring. I, I just decided, well, I'm doing this even if I don't get an A. And can I tell you what was my, what was my grade for my practice teaching? I didn't even know they had that, A plus. And I was the first honor student in not just Money College, the island. The first award and only award that was given for an honors degree. I got that. And you know why I got that? I'm not brighter than nobody else. What? I'm brave, courageous, and I'm willing to explore and try something that's different because I get very bored easily. And that's why I'm like this. And I just hope that the best of me and the best of my contributors will rub off on you as we call for the papers for the next edition. So I'll pass them around for you to just see them. We didn't do a lot because we still want to make sure that when we do the 100 that we are printing, you know, we do it. Because this was just me sitting on the computer, publisher, but they have people who make a living to make magazines. You know what I mean? With the nice programs that will make it good. So I'll pass them around for you to see them when the, when the launch comes. And so, Dr. Canute, how do we symbolically, you have launched so many books. How do we symbolically launch something at the point where you know that this is the moment where the launch actually is? What do we do? Do we hold it up? 
Do we call others to touch it? What do you do? How do you launch something? So, my, my, so you, yes, adjust it. But I think we may want to invite, first of all, the, others to come. Yes, invite the, invite the August speaker to be the first recipient of a copy. And um, we will have that with all the bells and whistles. And then we could have one picture. The, a picture with all the ah, authors. Um, all the authors. Yes, yes. You seem to do it so many times. Yes. So, you know, say he's the man who knows. It says volume one and volume two. And remember, if we can say draft, because but this is what the color, that's the color and everything. Just it's two volumes. Volume one and so on. So symbolically, that's how we do it. And we take picture. All right. So with your permission, we invite um, Dr. Smith and for you to hand him a copy of, of the first volume. So, you, Dr. Smith, who better to hand this to? Someone who has such command of the language. <laughs> and someone who has motivated us so much. And in fact, what you shared with us this afternoon was really the spirit of soldiering. And it gives me great pleasure to hand this to you as a symbolic release to the public eyes in this launch. Picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the other persons who have contributed to the writing. And we have the authors around there a little. And notice it's a circle. And you know why I put them in a circle? You know why? The professional learning community. And you know what a circle is like. It expands. It expands, don't? So it's going to get rather. So I call you all now. So Dr. Wilmot, could you come? And as you take yours, you just pose beside the photo. Come, Dr. Anne-Marie. Please come. OK. Mrs. Cherie, please come. Just, um, OK. You, uh, you want, and then you stand beside you. God bless you and thank you. Could you go there and stand because you want a group thing right beside there. We're taking the instructions from the veteran. Thank you so much, Shirley. Thank you. So, I'm sure the college is proud of you. And I mean, Monique is my turf. I mean, neighbor string cut there, meet husband there. So it's a good place for me and I'm part of their, their family. And I, I thank you so much for, you know, believing in this. All right? Okay. Where are we now? My little shy ones. My little babies. Come. Both of you come at the same time. I mean, they should be doing their assignments, don't? And you know, not only this that they have contributed to. Another book is coming out soon, and it's all of the rigors online. And these two ladies found time to also write an article for that. Isn't that great? And they're just here to study. This is what, this is the culture we're trying to build. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Don't go away now. Who else is here for those who have contributed? Come and join us here, please. Come, come around here. And somebody who is here standing as if he has nothing to do with it. Two persons in here, like they don't have anything to do with this magazine. You'd be surprised to know they also have contributed to this. Dr. McCallum has left. So I'm going to call our guest speaker who also has an article in the magazine. And then guess who else has an article in the magazine? I thought you would know already. Me? No, man, I'm the least. Dr. Canute, could you come forward, please? And Anthony Perry, Anthony has left the room, but here comes Diane. Okay, so, and then of course, if I give it to them, you know, I'm going to take it back from them. That is what you do in launches, symbolically give. <laughs> she take it in such a way that it means that you're not getting back this one. <laughs> All right, so there we go, and let us move over now. This part of the process. Some can do it. I don't know how you will get those
Thanks to everyone. So the program now calls for closing remarks and vote of thanks. And as I sat there and I uh, immersed myself in what this event represents, there are two sets of words that uh, entered my consciousness. Um, I want to call them the seven C's and the four E's. So I'll describe this evening as an evening of creativity, of celebration of culture, consciousness, courage, commitment within the context of Caribbean commons. I also think the evening represents a reminder, uh, an, what might I say, an, an exhortation about the need to embrace language, to elevate expressions, and to endear ourselves to exploration as we strive towards excellence. Those are the remarks I'd like to make as a closing. And to simply thank you, by the way, if you, if you check me on the, the arithmetic, it was a little bit more than seven and five, but <laughs> don't, don't, don't hold against me. <laughs> so first of all, let me thank those of you who have come from your various colleges, as far as Mandeville, as far as St. Anne, are those the two farthest places from which we have come? St. Saint, Saint James. Okay, well, let's acknowledge us. So let's see the people from St. James. Let's have you stand. Uh, again. Oh, we did that at the beginning? Well, please stand, please stand. The people from St. James. We want to thank you. And that's your vice principal, you know. Two teachers of English and your vice principal. Bless you, bless you. So let's travel up the hill. Anybody from Trelawney? We don't have any colleges in Trelawney yet. <laughs> so, so let's go to the next parish. I think it's St. Anne. So, no, no, we're taking the north coast. We're traveling this way, <laughs> if I might. So let's, let's the people from St. Anne, from St. Anne. Monique people, could you stand? We want to thank you. We want to thank you for being here. So I want all of us to see. Thank you. That's the people from St. Anne. And we now enter the parish of St. Catherine. Do we have any colleges in St. Catherine? G.C. Foster. Is G.C. Foster here? No. no. So let's wrap around through Kingston and invite our people from Edna Manley to stand. Edna Manley. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, we should have come through the, through the Northern Hills. Shortwood. Anybody from Shortwood here? Please. Let's... let's well, Shortwood has the largest delegation. Let's give them a double round of applause. All right, Shortwood. And let's then head on the south coast. I think we can skip some places. Any, any, any other place from Kingston? Any other? St. Joseph? St. Joseph, no? Uh, no? Uh, Michael, Michael, please be recognized. Please stand. Thank you. So can we leave Kingston now? Yes? So we're heading south. Uh, we're heading west on the south coast. So we take, first of all, Clarendon. Any colleges in Clarendon? No? Manchester, the parish of Manchester. Let's have Church Jesus College. Very well, very well. Then we go to Bethlehem, to St. Elizabeth, Bethlehem. Let's have Bethlehem, the second largest delegation. Excellent. And I think it's safe to stop there. So, Portland. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> We're not sure. Case, case, case. Did we have case? How could we miss case? Is, are you from case? Case, case. Please stand, sir. Be recognized. And a special thank you to Miss Jean Hastings, who would have us not omit you. From the Ministry of Education. From the Ministry of Education. Formally up. Right. Educator and management consultant ever. Okay.
Okay, so I want to first of all thank the Prof Hutton, who has left us, for the role he played in leading us off and helping to place the issue in context. I want to thank the, uh, is it um, Mr. Marvin Williams? William? Is Mr. Williams from, from um, Edna Manley, who gave us the background to this piece of creative work that is being undertaken by our, our young scholar. May I, have your, may I call you by your name? JC. 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 And please, please remember to give her the feedback. Yes. Because, you know, she wants the feedback on our research. Indeed. I want to thank Dr. Wilmot, who is a member of the um, working group and who has brought her scholarship and her colleagues to this event. I want to thank the contributors to the magazine just to indicate to you that, as Dr. Ferrer has, has said, um, the issue two of volume one will be out soon, so you could look out for that. And you can always be preparing your articles for the, the next issue for volume two and issue one and so on. I want to thank the guest speaker for reminding us of the tremendous importance of this tool, this facility we have called language which we can use to accomplish so many things, to solve so many problems, to articulate so many realities, and to make ourselves more conscious of our context and to convey that consciousness. I want to thank Dr. Ferreira and her team for this initiative. This initiative, I believe, represents what I'd call a new dimension in public scholarship. As Dr. Ferrer has said, we have tended to buy into the notion that unless the idea, the research, is published in some scholarly journal, it does not fit the standards of scholarship. And I would suggest, consistent with the points made by Dr. Ferrer, that part of the reason the consciousness that ought to be characteristic or that could be characteristic of our community, part of the reason that consciousness is not at the level it should be is because there is this tendency for us to, um, in the old days, we say, hug up the thing. We hug up the scholarship. The truth is, as doc, um, uh, discussions between Dr. Ferrer and, and I and uh, um, between us, uh, Dr. Fern and me, discussions between us, as one of the things we're finding, and the research is showing, is that scholarly work published in traditional journals hardly get read. The data suggests that 82% of what is published in, of, of research work published out of the humanities never get read. It's not that the work is deficient, it's partly because people do not read and partly because the mechanism, the medium through which we are publishing these ideas is not accessible to the reader. So what this magazine represents, what this initiative represents is a new approach to making public scholarship or making scholarship available to the, a wider cross-section of people who, who, would, who need it and who are likely to use it. So I'd want to add my own word of commendation as I close this vote of thanks to Dr. Ferrer and her team, and to thank you for being part of history. In another 20 years' time, when the university celebrates 40 years of research, research days, we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of SOTRAIL. So you're part of history. And by that time, some of you will, would have written several articles. You would have devised a variety of solutions to some of the problems our society is facing. And you would be reflecting on those solutions in the aftermath of the implementation of those solutions. So let us give thanks to creativity, to courage, or for creativity and courage, for consciousness, for community, and let us strive for excellence. May God bless you.